Mr. Sharba, can you hear me? I certainly can, sir. How are you today? Doing good. We can hear you loud and clear. Uh, I know we've met. I'm Andrew Morgan. I'm the chair of the Seventh Circuit JNC, and we're here doing interviews for the circuit spot uh, being uh, vacated by the retirement of Judge Christensen. Uh, and so we like to start our interviews by asking the applicants uh, to introduce themselves to the other commissioners and to explain why you want to be a circuit court judge. Right. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Mr. Morgan as the chair and the other uh, commission members for the time that you take out of your, I'm sure, busy schedules and your own practices in order to perform this very viable, valuable function uh, in the nominating and application process. My name is Richard Kevin Sharbaugh. I go by Kevin. Um, uh, I'm from originally born in Louisiana. Uh, I come from working class parents. Uh, my father uh, ended up, he was a Baptist pastor when I was a child. He thought uh, television was the tool of the devil. So we did not have one in my house. And as a result, I became a very uh, voracious reader. Uh, that uh, early life experience served me well and to, to my uh, other career path when I was in the military and the Navy, as well as uh, when I would do boat deliveries uh, across uh, transatlantic uh, boat deliveries. But I, I ended up, we ended up in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I went to high school. Uh, and upon graduation, I did join the military. I was on submarines. I was a nuclear trained machinist mate on submarines. Uh, and I served a six year uh, tour or enlistment in the United States Navy. Following that, I came back to the Jacksonville area and did a number of uh, different small jobs uh, for a period of time. Uh, ended up, uh, basically ended up going out and joining the um, tall ship Bounty, which was a big square rig ship uh, that would go up and down the Eastern seaboard uh, into various ports of call for Founders Days, festivals and such. Uh, while I was on that ship, I ended up getting a 100 ton captain's license, 4,000 horsepower designated duty engineer's license. Uh, and also during my time there, that's when I met Gay Esperson, who is my life partner. I've been, we've been together 23 years now. Uh, after a year and a half on that ship, um, I basically decided to uh, swallow the anchor, as they used to say, and uh, left the ship and Gay and I ended up together at the time in St. Augustine on a sailboat. Uh, from there, back in 2002, we started looking for a property where I could have a dock. It ended up being on the St. Johns River instead of the intercoastal. That's what led me to be in uh, Putnam County, Florida. Um, at that point, I had out of high school, no, uh, no additional education uh, other than self-taught. Once I ended up here, uh, this is the first time I owned property, needed to figure out how to deal with uh, basic uh, shrubbery and trees and plants and stuff. So we went to a roadside nursery, saw there was a program being given by the local ag center on how to deal with trimming trees or and such. So we went to that. And from there, I decided I was interested in uh, becoming a master gardener. So I'd take some time off from going to sea to uh, do some uh, master gardener classes. I decided I'd like to take the advanced biology course at the local community college in tandem with that. That's what got me in the doors of higher education. So I went to two years at St. John's, what's now River uh, Community College. Uh, from there, I rolled over to University of Florida. I got my four-year degree, applied to uh, University of Florida School of Law uh, and was accepted. Uh, so I did seven years straight through, came out the other end in 2010 uh, as a member of the Florida Bar, October 10th, 2010. I uh, joined a firm, a two-man firm uh, called Kaiser and Woodward, uh, based in Interlock in Florida, which has a population of about 1,200 people, I believe. Uh, and after five years uh, working as an associate uh, with uh, Timothy Kaiser, Michael Woodward, Mr. Woodward decided to retire. And in a two-person partnership, if you want to continue a partnership after someone retires, someone else has to become partner. So I became partner by attrition is what I kind of jokingly say. Um, so it's Kaiser and Sharbo for the last five years. It is a, it's a full-on general practice. Uh, people say, oh, you're a lawyer. What kind of law do you practice? And I normally ref tell them I practice threshold law. And then they go, wow, what's that? And I go, whatever walks in the door. So that's, uh, and it truly is, 
there are certain things we normally refer out if it's an issue with workman's comp or social security or you know a lot of personal injury stuff we don't handle but we do some so it's been a very varied professional career um and at this point i get to the part where it's well why do i want to become a circuit court judge and to clarify I want to become a Putnam County Circuit Court judge. Um, and I understand that the circuit is the four counties and that there's uh, times when the need is uh, evident that someone needs to be transferred to another county or whatever. But reality is when I saw Judge Christensen's uh, letter of retirement and specifically her call out to say, uh, you know, Putnam County does have some unique qualities to it and uh, would be served well by someone who is a part of this county and community, uh, I took that to heart. And that along with some additional uh, unsolicited encouragement for me to apply, I went ahead and put together the application package and submitted it. And that's why I stand here before you today uh, seeking this uh, particular position uh, as a circuit court judge. Along with that, I would say that you know, my feeling or opinion on the matter is that our judicial system in this country, in the state, in this county, uh, really depends upon the public perception of its validity uh, and the public support. And I want to make sure that we continue to have that, uh, that perception from the public that, you know, our judiciary is doing the, uh, the correct thing uh, and that that is representing or it's basically responsive uh, as appropriate. Um, so that's that's kind of why I'm uh, interested in the position. Mr. Sharpa, if you were selected to be a circuit court judge, uh, it would be expected at some point you would probably end up on the criminal bench. Uh, yes, if the facts and the law supported the imposition of the death penalty, do you have a personal objection or would you be uh, able to impose the death penalty? I'm very glad that you asked me this question because it's something I actually spent some time this morning really taking the time to consider. I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I'm very glad that the the criminal system in Florida has been modified with the ruling coming out from Hearst and the subsequent ruling uh, with Ring v. Arizona so that it's no longer the position of a circuit court judge to make that recommendation. Instead, it's the position of the judge to consider a unanimous recommendation. And I believe that if I'm in a situation where I have a jury unanimously uh, finding guilt and unanimously finding beyond reasonable doubt on the, the factors mitigating in favor of a recommendation of a death sentence that I would be able to impose that sentence because the inherent worth and dignity of every life doesn't end when someone's life has been taken from them. That life still has inherent worth and dignity. And so it's not just to judge the living, but also in the context of the the action that's happened or the or the the crime that's been committed so the specific answer to your question is yes i believe i would be able to impose that sentence mr sharbaugh it's chris green good afternoon good afternoon sir can you have you put any thought to how you would go about moving forward a crowded docket and how you would move your cases forward and then just the business side of being a judge? Well, sir, in my private practice, I will say that I have a law partner and two support staff, but um, my use of my support staff is mostly limited to phones and scheduling and dealing with invoicing and billing. Uh, other than that, I do most of my own uh, drafting and my own filing, uh, and uh, that's basically given me a, a level of comfort with the uh, the actual task of, of drafting legal documents. Uh, as far as if placed on the bench, uh, I understand I'd have a judicial assistant. I interact with them all the time uh, to assist with those kind of scheduling, scheduling issues. 
Uh, and I'm also, I would say, fairly familiar with needing to spin multiple plates at one time, not necessarily knowing which one's going to be the priority at any given moment, but being able to respond uh, to that uh, needed priority. Um, so I, I say all that in by way of uh, observing that many times hearings or trials get scheduled up, which then subsequently get resolved on the eve. Of, the pressure of trial sometimes is a wonderful uh, leverage point to resolve litigation, especially I found in a family court. Uh, so uh, basically I, I work with the schedule uh, as it's put together, but understanding that there's often a time that opens up in order to shift gears and go back to, or move forward into other uh, uh, work that, that needs to be dealt with directly at that time. That's what I'd say. Thank you. Mr. Sharbaugh, th this is uh, Travis Mydock. Can you hear me? I can, sir. Can you tell us about your work that you do for the Putnam County Tax Collector? I can. Uh, prior to the current tax collector, Linda Myers, uh, the previous tax collector, uh, Ken Mahaffey, had an attorney somewhat on staff uh, who was retiring. And as he was, that attorney was retiring, they asked me to consider coming in and being general counsel uh, for the tax collector, and I agreed to do so. And so a lot of what I do is um, fairly standard and routine with regard to, um, there's a lot of development, highway department of transportation development happening. So you have a lot of takings cases that are in process here in Putnam County. Uh, so I represent the tax collector's interest in any uh, pro rata ad valorem taxes that would be due from any settlement uh, from a taking. I also deal with every year we have a, um, a warrants are issued for uh, unpaid tangible personal property taxes. So I put together that whole petition and bring it forward. Um, and then every so often you get the wild card that's um, someone who's claiming to be a sovereign citizen and has their own kingdom or empire and therefore not subject to the laws of taxation. Uh, and so I have put together the explanation that while that may be true as to you and your person, the, the dirt that you are talking about is in Putnam County, Florida, and therefore, according to the laws of the state of Florida, there's a tax associated to that. And you're, you're welcome to pay the tax incurred, or should you choose not to, which is your right, then someone else may choose to pay those taxes and end up with a property. So you have to, you have to be able to, uh, to employ a, a numerous means of communication. Uh, in my particular uh, position with the tax collector, as well as my other, my other clients that I represent. I, I think you're probably the only person that actually lives in Putnam County that has applied. I believe what that is you, true. What do you think uh, are the biggest challenges for a circuit judge presiding over a docket in Putnam County? It would, I would expect that the number of pro se litigants that come before the bar in Putnam County are significantly higher than in the other three counties in this circuit. Uh, I haven't seen data to support that, but just my anecdotal personal experience in the various courts here that I'm in, I see a lot of pro se uh, litigants. Um, sometimes it's two pro se litigants, sometimes one side's represented by counsel and the other isn't. So a lot of times, a lot of times I find as an attorney, part of what I'm doing is educating my client as to expectations and what legal realities are uh, so that they can then make decisions based upon that new understanding. Uh, sometimes, especially in say dependency court uh, and, and some of the other courts, you have people who coming before the bench who really, they just know that their children have been taken away, they're distraught, they don't really understand the process that's happening necessarily. Uh, a case in point very recently, I was just being asked as like a second opinion by someone about their children that it, are basically with the Department of Children and Families at this present time under, under the jurisdiction of DCF. And I had to clearly explain to them, look, 
even though the pending criminal charges against you about drug possession were dropped, you have to understand the difference in the burden of proof in a criminal case and the fact in your de dependency case, there's already been an adjudication that your children are dependent. And that burden of proof in that case is much lower and it's already been decided and the chance for an appeal of that has already passed. So I understand in your mind, the fact that those criminal charges were dropped should be dispositive. That's not the word I'd use with them. Of course, I said, that should basically say to the dependency court that, you know, hey, there was nothing here, please return my children. But that's not how this is working and going to work. And you need to change your focus from being argumentative about the fact that this other thing happened in the criminal court and shift that focus to being, okay, I recognize where we're at and what I need to do in order to obtain my children to have them return to me. And so here's how the steps I'm taking to meet my case plan in order to get the reunification to happen. And the very next time they were in front of the court, which was a day later, represented by appointed counsel, I got feedback both from them and from that newly appointed counsel saying, wow, there was a world of difference between last week and this week. And this person specifically emailed me and said, thank you so much. You know, I, now I understand, although, although I will always feel that this was wrong what happened, at least now I, I have an understanding of what's happening. Can you tell us about uh, your involvement with the Putnam Blueways and Trails? Yes, I can. There, um, this is back when trail systems were really just starting to uh, come into the county. And we have a lot of natural resources in Putnam County, but not a lot of tourism base. And with all these natural resources, especially as we're developing them to allow for biking paths, uh, and uh, we have equestrian trails here as well. Um, and also with our rivers and, and lakes, we have a lot of opportunities for kayaking trips and those kind of uh, opportunities. And um, some friends and myself and Gay, we were noticing that you know, even people who rent kayaks and do these trips don't live in Putnam County. And so what we need to do is form this organization that will actually sponsor and support these different kinds of activities so that first we get the local community to be involved in those kind of activities and enjoy and appreciate what we have and then expand that out to the near local and then state and then regional so that we start bringing in people to take uh, advantage in a good way of these natural resources so that we can have, you know, we can develop in an appropriate method without being reliant upon just developing, you know, additional residential or housing, etc. So that's exactly what we did. We formed the organization. We connected it up with the county on the county level. And then something that really turbocharged the effectiveness of that organization was within like the first year and a half of it being formed, there's an annual event called the, the Paddler's Rendezvous where a whole bunch of kayak clubs all over the state kind of each year pick a different place to go and spend like a whole weekend doing a whole bunch of different kayaking trips. And um, one of our members volunteered us for this very large logistical undertaking at the infancy of our organization. And at the time, I was either the chair or uh, or Gay was the chair, one or the other. We, we operate in tandem a lot like this. And we were able to really pull together um, a host of different interest groups uh, with support and put together a three-day uh, festival, if you will, with I think it was 13 or 14 different paddling trips that people could choose which ones they wanted to do. They were all uh, led by guides and they had sweeps and you know we had the uh, supports uh, personnel and that kind of thing. So that's um, that's kind of a in, a in a nutshell what Blue A's and Trails uh, is uh, focused on. It's uh, for the non-motorized use of our natural resources is really kind of what we were looking at. Hey, what is, what is the this race issues study circles of Putnam County? Okay. You were a founding member of it in 2006 and you're now a, a trustee from 2018. But I'm yes. curious as to what its purpose is and how has it, if appropriate, been involved in the past year given the events that have been occurring as it relates to race? Yes, I'm 
again, very glad to, to have the question and to, and to speak to it. Back in uh, 2006, that time frame, uh, Gay was still working. Uh, she was still uh, she was contracted to the CSX Railroad up in Jacksonville and doing programs for uh, training of engineers, computer programs. The city of Jacksonville at that time and may still be were providing what they called race. They called them racism study circles. It was in part in response to a federal uh, a lawsuit that had occurred with regard to race relations in Jacksonville, Florida. And so they had these groups, their small group meetings, meeting once a week for about an hour and a half to two hours for a five to six sessions with a, a minimal of a curriculum just to get the participants to come together and start having an open discussion from their own personal experiences and sharing from their own, uh, their own experience. Uh, you know, their observations uh, and input. And so it, it's a means by which friendships can be built and understandings cross-culturally can develop so that you don't have separated communities with no bridges. It's building those bridges of community within these communities. That was in Jacksonville. Gay got invited up there we both decided to attend and we invited some friends of ours, uh, some uh, black friends of ours here in Putnam County that we had recently met. Hey, this is happening in Jacksonville. Are you interested in doing that together? They said, yes. The first time we went up, we took separate cars. And after that, of course, we said, this is silly. We should be carpooling together. So we're driving up and talking and forming uh, friendships to and from these meetings that were happening in Jacksonville. When we came back after those, those sessions, we said, we looked around and said, you know, it might be very helpful for our community here in Putnam to have something similar. And that's where race issue study circles was formed was those participants that had experienced that in Jacksonville uh, basically brought that structure here to Putnam County. So we incorporated it uh, and trained as facilitators and it, it went for a couple of years and then it kind of died down a little bit and you know, okay. And then just recently, of course, there's been, a, it's cyclical in nature, these, these kind of issues that happen in the community, I believe. Uh, and so it's a lot smarter to have relationships developed and built before an incident or a flashpoint happens than wait and try to respond. Uh, and so the study circles Back after the incident, or if you want to call it the incident, when Charlottesville uh, was in the news, the mayor uh, here in Putnam County called together a community meeting, a whole bunch of people got together, uh, and he was just talking about this need for us to live together as a community and, and to try to understand each other's perspectives. And he was taking solicitation of, of input from the audience, and one of the ladies in the audience stood up and said, hey, we used to have something called study circles, whatever happened to that? And why don't we have those now? And so that kind of re-energized the, the, the use of the study circles and that came back into being an active, um, an active group. And uh, even uh, right this moment, I believe there's a, a study circle happening. We, we've shifted it, it's been shifted to remotely via Zoom uh, so that you know people are comfortable uh, as far as being socially distanced and all, but um, it uh, it allows, like I said, it, it just allows for people to uh, develop relationships uh, that they would not necessarily uh, find themselves in a position or in a comfortable place to 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 have those relationships. So it's a it's a safe space for people to to interact with each other on these issues. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, Mr. Sharba, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Our uh, process is that uh, once we are done and we have the certified list, we will reach out uh, by phone to all members, let them know if they made it onto the final list or not. Uh, and are you, my guess is that's around five o'clock. I can't be certain, but will you be available uh, on the cell phone ending in eight, seven. 
I should be. I just got a snap hearing called on me for four o'clock this afternoon, but it should be resolved by five o'clock. And I would well, say, we'll, I go ahead, sir. We'll leave a message if you don't answer. Very well. Um, I'll be mindful of the fact that I should be available at five o'clock. I'll just say that's exactly the process I use as a director with the community theater after auditions. Everyone gets a phone call, regardless of how things sorted themselves out in the in the application or the uh, the process. So I appreciate yes. that, and thank you all very much once again for the service that you provide in this in this role. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.